Good evening and welcome. I'm Vic Marks, and tonight we continue with the third week of 10 questions, if not now, when? 10 questions was created as both an undergraduate course and a public program designed to emphasize the public in public university. We wanna connect you, our students, and you, our extended community, as we also connect some of the most compelling thinkers and doers from UCLA and beyond. We hope to not only raise awareness of the profoundly interdisciplinary nature of knowledge, but to also extend an invitation to see differently together. It's fitting then that tonight's question is, how do we connect? For those of you joining us for the first time, in week one, we asked, who are we? Challenging the presumption that I am speaking for everyone when I casually say we. Sometimes the word we is used to assume that everyone thinks and feels simil similarly when in fact, not everyone does. In that first week, we also reached for the possibility of becoming a we in ways that can be inclusive of our very different experiences and histories. Can we aspire to become a truly inclusive we? Because there are big projects like a continuing pandemic, an increasingly urgent climate crisis, systemic social and economic injustice and polarized politics that will require us to care about these things together. It perhaps has never been more important for us to come out of our separate bubbles to support a vision focused on the common good. These are lofty aspirations, but if not now, when? Thus, our second question last week was, how do we begin? As in, how do we begin again? How do we set new intentions? Or what on earth do we do now? Well, one thing we can do now is figure out how to connect. I I'm asking myself to be a better listener, to better align my intentions with their impact, and to reflect on the way my perspective, my perspective is derived from my privileged experience. Is it possible to build a bridge, acknowledge a rift, reach out a hand, and make friends with discomfort? I acknowledge that I am, and each of you are, already connected in a myriad of ways. For example, by being here, you are quite simply connected to everyone else who happens to be here. And that's something. Please take a moment and write your first name and where you're joining from in the chat. Let's do that. Thank you, I'm seeing those names coming in. Yes. And here we are. Please add your name. And as we continue doing that or complete doing that, I also want to acknowledge that there's people who are not here tonight but who have made it possible for you to be here, possibly a parent, a mentor, a child, a friend. So now I wanna ask, who are you tethered to? Who is not here in this webinar? Please write their names in the chat and in so doing, bring them into this virtual room with us. Let's take a moment to write the names of the people who made it possible for you to be here, even if it's just one. I'm shaking my head because I'm reading, you know, just the collection of parents and friends and counselors and the names of people who we may not know, but who are important to those of us here. Thank you for doing this. Connection. 
The format for this evening will include a 10 minute presentation from each of our three guests, followed by a very special sharing made by ninth grade students from Los Angeles County High School for the Arts. And I wanna ask right now, ninth graders, are any of you here? Because if you're here, we wanna celebrate what you've done with, with everyone else here. Um, we're going to follow up that very special sharing by the ninth graders with a conversation amongst our guests and we'll conclude with your questions, which you may submit in the chat or by using the Q&A feature. When we reach the end of our program at or near 8.30 p.m. Pacific time, we'll say good evening to you all. I'm now delighted and honored to introduce our first guest, Morton Bay. Morton Bay is an award-winning research fellow at the Center for the Digital Future and a lecturer in digital and social media at USC Annenberg. He holds a PhD in information studies from UCLA. Morton has spent the last two decades researching emerging technologies and their impact on Western societies from both commercial and academic viewpoints. His current research focuses on political communication on social media and how emerging technology impacts democracy, social justice, and the economy overall. Morton has also been active as a political consultant advising numerous governmental agencies in the US and Europe, and has worked as a journalist writing feature articles and op-eds for numerous media outlets Morton, your particular skills and interests are so important to us this evening and well beyond this evening. Welcome. Thank you so much. Um, so when I was faced with this question, um, my thoughts immediately went in the same direction as, um, as Vic was, was uh, expressing before when when and I, thank you for that Vic. the the when, when she asked you all to write your names in the chat um and i think it's a that's such a wonderful way of, of starting a a session i'm, I'm going to steal that <laughs> I, I really love that because it does tell you something about connection as a as a as a an immediate thing that's not just something that we think about in technological terms which is what i usually do uh my normal uh my normal work is is all about how uh, connection happens through some kind of tool or instrument. Um, and we forget, which is one of the things I'm going to remind you of, uh, that connection is actually a very human thing. Um, so the question you can, when, for me, when I saw this question, how do we connect? Uh, the first thing that popped into my head was to add the word now. How do we connect right now? Uh, in the sense that we might also be talking later on about how we connect in the future. Um, because as we are re-emerging from this pandemic, there's a lot of, as Vic said, said, there's a lot of decisions that we're gonna have to make about who we are, what we're doing. There, there, there are gonna be a lot of new things up in the air that needs to be reconsidered. So let me add this to the conversation. Um, if we look at this image here, I don't know, it de depends on how good your screen are, whether you can see all the, sorry, over here, all the small um, lines here, but this is essentially a big network. Now, a network, of course, is essentially a bundle of connections, right? If when we put connections together, we call them networks. This network is a, a, a particular network. This is a network of uh, Twitter users that are discussing politics and how they connect to each other and form sort of areas in the network depending on their political beliefs. So this is what we normally think of as, as you know, uh, a network today. We think, you know, network, a lot of people say network, social network, social media, um, and, and kind of conflate the terms, even though there's, that's a little controversial maybe. Um, it's, it's especially controversial because we've been studying social networks for a lot longer than we've been studying um, uh, technological networks. Um, and the reason why that's the case is because we as humans have had social networks a lot longer than we've had technology. In fact, this over here, 
there is uh, a network uh, map that shows how uh, members of the Hadza tribe in Tanzania, who is probably the only tribe left on uh, planet Earth that still lives as hunter-gatherers completely without technology, how their um, social network when they um, exchange gifts with themselves or visit each other or have conversations or do things with each other, how that network maps out. That's, that's how that would look. Like this is a real social network. This is people being social with each other. Um, now, if we zoomed in a little more on this, we would probably find roughly the same complexity as here, but there's just no technology involved in this one which I think is, is really important. There's no technology involved in this network either. This is yeast. This is essentially the proteins that are in yeast um, and the, the cellular structure of, of some of the main uh, proteins in yeast and the way that they connect together. Um, it turns out that when we start looking into things like cells in our bodies, we find these networks that look exactly the same as when we are out there in the world as humans connecting with each other. Um, even in our brains, this is a network in the brain. This is how different parts of the brain connect to make us do things to, uh, you know, when we think thoughts, how, how do co different parts of the brain connect to each other? That's an illustration of that. And I hope you can see all the, 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 the similarities here, uh, because what I'm really just trying to say is that networking and, and, co and connection, like connecting with others, is one of the most natural things we do as humans. Uh, in fact, when we look at how the brain works and, and sort of more recent uh, um, uh, neuroscientific discoveries, what we're finding more and more is that we're, we're simply wired for connections with other people. Um, uh, and it's, you can then start, you know, asking if, if we're so good at networking, if, if our networks are, are so um, uh, intricate and, and uh, from the cellular level in our bodies all the way up to our social behavior, how come we don't act like social animals? How come we have a tendency to uh, do things that, that animals wouldn't do, like hurt each other, or uh, do specific things, hurt each other without it being in defense, for example? Um, or uh, in some, you know, why, why are we not adhering to the same rules of nature? Um, I mean, this is not a new idea. Uh, Aristotle came about the whole idea of social anim uh, humans as a social animal. Uh, back in, you know, 30, 335 uh, to 323 before the Common Era. Um, so Aristotle had this idea already, but something ha has happened in between Aristotle and now that, uh, that has made us this way, uh, where, we're, where we're often using the, the communication technologies that we have um, to, uh, you know, try to bring down democracy or lie to each other through misinformation or in other ways not uh, connect when we have the tools to do it. Um, if you look at this, this is the development of communication technologies since 1840 when the telegraph came around. The telegraph is really important because it's the first time that you take something uh, that can connect two people and and reduce distance completely. Uh, if you think about it, if you try to send a message from um, a person in the US to a person in the UK before the telegraph, what would happen is essentially you have to write it down, put it on a boat, wait for it to, uh, to, to be sailed over to the UK, and then the person could read it and respond. Uh, with the telegraph, in one, with one fell swoop, that be, it gets reduced from weeks to, to essentially seconds. And so it's not weird that that was a big revolution. And then when you get the telephone on top of that, uh, both of which, by the way, are networks, the telegraph and, and the telephone, when you, uh, when you get the telephone on top of that, which is essentially just a, a further innovation of the telegraph, where you can send voice down the, the line, um, you start getting networks that look something like this. This is a map from 1901 where uh, you can see the many different telegraph lines that were already in place at the time. This is, this is telephone and telegraph lines 
um, across the world in 1901. So there's a lot here between Europe and the U.S. There's uh, there's a lot going down to South America. Uh, there's you know a lot inside Europe and then going over to India. So if you if you know your history, of course, this is very colonial based, right? This is all about the the former colonies being able to telegraph and telephone out to um, to uh, or telegraph back to uh, the colonial motherland or um, from the colonies. Uh, so it was all about political control, right? Um, interestingly, if you look at what that looks like today, this is the internet. Uh, this is the, the undersea cables, the undersea cable network that makes the internet possible. And if you don't, I, I hope you can see the similarities here. Nothing much has changed in that regard. Um, and, and so you might want to think, wait a minute, uh, how does this play into how um, we have gotten worse at connecting even though we have more ways of doing it than ever before? Well, let me go back to this uh, cable map here. Now, I said something about the colonial um, powers before, and, and that, of course, is a terrible history that we don't want to get too much into. But what's also true about all of this is that most of this was public telegraph and telephone. Uh, this, these, were, these, um, these telephone uh, and telegraph lines were owned by public companies, except for over here in the U.S., where, which was pretty much the only place that didn't happen. But in the 1980s, early 1980s, war leaders like Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan uh, literally privatized the whole thing uh, and, and deregulated it, which meant that we now have, have a situation where these folks are in charge of the same communications. So because of that deregulation in the 1980s, those people are now middlemen in the communication that we have with each other. And the platforms they control are essentially sitting in between us all, uh, uh, sort of mediating the, the, uh, the way that we can communicate with each other. I don't have time to go into um, why that is such a bad idea um, and, and, and how many um, issues there are with that. But I do want to point to the future, as I mentioned earlier. How do we connect in the future when we come out of this pandemic? How do we move forward? Uh, and so to end uh, with that, I want to point to a uh, new initiative that's coming up right now. And I was so happy to hear um, uh, how Vic uh, talked about um, uh, uh, this being a public event at a public university, because I'm very much about the public. And, and um, and so are people like um, Eli Pariser, who came up with the term uh, filter bubble, uh, MIT uh, genius Ethan Sugerman, um, and they're currently starting initiatives like new public and digital public infrastructure that are uh, I, that, that tries to push for an internet that is more public in nature. The Electronic uh, Frontier Foundation calls it the public interest internet. Um, and so we can start thinking, can we actually build an infrastructure, an internet, a, con a place with all the different content styles and types that we have in, um, uh, on the internet now, but that is owned and run by the public. Can we do that? Well, they've done it in Europe for about 100 years uh, through what is known as public service, what was, what was uh, before public service broadcasting and what they now call public service media. So, you know, I want to end with that. I want to end by saying this is a, uh, we have a, an opportunity right now when we ask the question, how do we connect, to insert ourselves as a community into that question and say, we connect with each other through means that we control ourselves. Thank you very much. Mm. Martin, thank you so much here to contemplate everything from um, the very concept of networks as something that you know occurs in yeast, yeast samples or in our brains, and 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 of course all the way to the internet and so on. Thank you for that. And then also, um, you know, just clearly you you thinking about the way privatization has really and and I and I imagine you know corporate gain, individual gain, financial gain has really. Um, stood in the way of thinking about the common good. Um, thank you. That's a lot to chew on. I hope we're kind of come back to talk about that later um, once everyone has presented. But what a great start to the evening, very provocative as well. So 
Our next guest is UCLA's Vice Chancellor for Communication, a professional communicator, Mary Osako. Mary is UCLA's inaugural Vice Chancellor for Strategic Communications. And in this role, she oversees communications, media relations, brand marketing, the UCLA Content Studio, which is a singular centralized hub for content creation at UCLA, and helps maintain and enhance UCLA's reputation as a world-class public research university. Mary has spent more than 20 years of experience leading complex communications efforts at some of the most innovative Fortune 500 companies in the world, including as Chief Communications Officer of Activision Blizzard, Head of Global Corporate Communications at Amazon, and Vice President of Corporate International and Public Policy Communications at Yahoo. An LA native, and a PR Week 2021 Hall of Femme honoree, like that, Mary earned her bachelor's degree in psychology and a specialization in Asian American studies from UCLA. Welcome, Mary. Thank you, Vic, for that very um, kind introduction. And I also want to just thank the School of the Arts and Architecture for hosting this really meaningful series. And um, I'm excited to learn from my fellow, fellow panelists. So when I was given this question, how do we connect? I uh, was stumped. So I did what every modern day person does when stumped with the really good questions and I Googled it. And I have right here what I found when I searched for a how do we connect post COVID. And I thought I'd share a few with you. One, join a film or book club, okay? Two, learn a new hobby with friends like bread baking or quilting. Three, walk the dog. Um, it doesn't say what to do for those of us who don't have a dog, but there you have it. Tonight, I thought I would focus and offer some thoughts of how to connect that may not be on that Google list, but certainly are dear and near to my heart. And it's this, share your vulnerability. What does it mean to be vulnerable? Vulnerability is a state of emotional exposure that has some level of uncertainty to it. And you know, given that, the question is, why would this then help us connect? It is my deep belief that the most lasting and profound connections come from those when we have a shared experience of foundation. And we take that shared experience and we share it and we tell that story and we give it as a gift. And to me, that's when I found, and I think we share the most personal and deepest of connections. And when I think about this moment of time right now in this world of going through and grappling with the pandemic, to me, it's a really rare time when the entire world is going through a collective trauma. The pandemic has really put in our lives and touched every single one of us in a way where uncertainty has been the norm, where we all have a vulnerability that we struggle with, wakes, up up, wakes us up in the middle of the night, stays in our minds and lingers there as we say goodnight. And to me, I think it creates and has created a really interesting opportunity to connect with one another. Our stories of success and joy are definitely worthy of sharing and, and sharing to connect with someone, but also our stories of pain and struggle and maybe some grief. And uh, I think that's really powerful. You know, I think that we all want to be seen as um, strong and we want to all be seen as capable and maybe even admirable. And for the UCLA students out there who are logged on, 
I suspect this may resonate with many of you as to be accepted to UCLA might mean that you are at the top of the top of your class. And so admitting to the cracks in the armor to maybe go against our better instincts, and especially if we already feel like outsiders or have a feel of being judged um, or being seen less than, it's not easy. Um, and I do think that it requires a great deal of vulnerability. But to me, connecting through that vulnerability is an incredibly powerful and rewarding way to go through life. And I thought I would share a little bit, um, a story of sharing about one's vulnerability and one that I shared during the time of the pandemic. Um, and this is, you know, where we are right now, 19 months of being in this pandemic. And for all the storytellers out there and all the fellow communicators out there, it's a really odd sense from being hyper-connected because of who you are and as Morton described, sort of the on the human level, our need to connect with one another to feeling totally disconnected in so many ways. And so uh, during the pandemic, I decided to share a story of vulnerability with the, on a Zoom, just like this, with hundreds of fellow communicators and storytellers. And it's a personal story that I had held really close to the vest. Um, and it started off when I was a junior here at UCLA uh, with a phone call that I received. And it was from my mom. And she said, dad's been carjacked. He's in a coma, hurry and come home. I rem remember getting into my Honda right then and there and driving home to Culver City where I met with my mom and my sister at my mom's house and seeing the police there. And my mom doesn't speak English. Um, so she didn't quite understand it when they asked her questions like, is your dad, is your husband uh, dealing drugs? Why is he known to carry a around a lot, large wad of cash? But my sister and I understood. And it's because uh, my dad had been a crack addict for a really long time. And the first time that uh, I had known about it was when I was in the eighth grade. And what I shared on the Zoom with my fellow village here at UCLA was that uh, the day when I found out, and that was Jay when I was in eighth grade. And I remember being home alone and one of our neighbors came knocking at our metal screen door. I went to go and answer the door. And I remember this neighbor telling me through the screen door, keep, your dad away from our house. You see that day, my dad was going door to door asking to borrow $20 for his next hit um, with his girlfriend in tow, both high on crack. Later, I remember seeing my mom that day going door to door late at night, uh, ringing each doorbell to return any borrowed money from our neighbors, bowing deeply after each ring. And I remember sharing this story of vulnerability um, earlier this year, the spring. And the thing that was most surprising and powerful was the fact that I will tell you, I was so surprised at how many people reached out to me, sharing and really gifting me their story of vulnerability. And to me, it is one of those connections um, that I will remember many, many years from now. And it, honestly, I don't think it would have happened if not for the fact that we're in this pandemic. You know, as you see right now in back of me, being on Zooms, whether you're in a class or in a meeting, do you remember when we were all on Zoom? We couldn't quite figure out how to um, turn our backgrounds on, or at least I couldn't. And you get to sort of see and peek in to people's personal lives, voluntarily or not. 
and you just get to see a little bit about what they're going through that you may never have seen if it were just inside our office walls or our classroom, classroom walls. And I think that level of vulnerability, the shared vulnerability, the shared trauma that we're going through, I feel like that really gives us an opportunity to connect on a really much deeper level. And it reminded me of a quote by Brene Brown, where she says, our stories are not meant for everyone. Hearing them is a privilege. And we should always ask, who has earned the right to hear my story? If we have one or two people in our lives who can sit with us and hold space for our shame stories and love us for our strengths and struggles, we are incredibly lucky. My hope as we talk about this big question tonight of how do we connect is that we might connect on a deeper level by sharing our vulnerability, that you may see some of yourself in the stories of others and what their lived experiences have been, and that you may see some of yourself in that. And you might develop even more gratitude for the fact that you may have been spared some of these struggles, that you'll learn to see in others their full and most complex selves. And you might see a little bit more of yourself too. My greatest hope is that it might allow you to be your full self with them. I'll end with one more quote, and that's from James Baldwin, once who said that he used to think that his pain and heartbreak were unprecedented in the history of the world. But through reading and writing and hearing the stories of others, he learned that the things that tormented him most were the very things that connected him with all the people who were alive, who had ever been alive. To me, that's a really moving message of connection and shared humanity. My hope is that we collectively create space to reconnect in a vulnerable, bit, vulnerable way, in a maybe more human way. And maybe being more fully human will mean being more fully alive. Thank you. Mm. Oh, Mary, thank you for your story and for just um, taking this whole question to another register. Um, both registers are important, you know, but I think that um, especially in this time of trauma to both bear in mind the ways in which we are made designed, I don't know, evolved to network, but also to understand that there are, um, there are such deep ways to connect. And actually, when you model that very vulnerability with us, it's an invitation for the rest of us to join you right there. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Nick. Um, I'm going to um, make a, a shift. And I already feel like the um, the potentials of this evening are abundant or perhaps already being realized. So our third guest this evening is an artist whose heart and clarity of vision constantly inspire me. Luis Alfaro is a Chicano playwright born and raised in the Pico Union District of Los Angeles. He was recently named Associate Artistic Director of the Center Theater Group the resident theater company of the Music Center of Los Angeles County. Amongst his numerous awards and recognitions, Luis is a MacArthur Genius Grant Fellowship recipient and is the only playwright to have received two Kennedy Center Fund for New American Play Awards in the same year. His much celebrated plays and performances have been seen at regional theaters throughout the United States, Latin America, Canada, and Europe. Luis is an associate professor at USC and previously taught at CalArts and in the writer's program at UCLA Extension. Welcome, Luis. Hi, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Hello, everyone. Um, it's just incredible to be here. And thank you to Mary, who just created some deep vulnerability for me. I just have to say, 
I keep a neutral background behind me because I'm always working with really, really emotional people. So I should be vulnerable right now and tell you that my background really just consists of a $4.99 $4 sheet that I bought from the clearance at Target. And I have a $3.99 lamps. So um, that's my vulnerability. I'm kind of like telling you who I am. Um, I'm so happy to be here and to tell you a little bit about myself. I am a playwright. I am in the business of storytelling and stories in the theater are based on feelings. So what I count on most is having emotions, all of them. I welcome all the voices and characters that show up in my head. Contrary to popular, uh, uh, popular thinking, I'm not always crying and I'm not always talking to myself. Well, I do talk to myself a lot, but I, I do sort of tend to control my emotions. But I do count on language and movement and I also count on the depth of space. So theater is where we feel emotion and the body in, in an open space, the 3D of space. An actor on stage is composed of mind, body, and spirit. The ingredients for making our work as provided by the visionary playwright Anne Bogart are passion, point of view, and craft. Passion, desire point of view, opinion, and craft technique. I was born and raised in downtown Los Angeles in a very crowded, poor, and violent neighborhood, as you just heard, known as Pico Union. I was raised in community, which is to say that all of the mothers in my neighborhood raised us, they fed us, and I see myself constantly in the communal. I live in Koreatown now, Koreatown is one of the densest neighborhoods in the entire United States. So uh, 46,000 residents per square mile compared to the average 7,000 per square mile in LA County. 95% of the people in Koreatown are working class people who rent rather than own. So as you can see, I never ever work alone. Uh, there is a collaborative sport in the theater where I work with the director, a producer, designers, among others, but most of all, I work with actors. Actors take my language and they translate, they interpret, and sometimes if the alchemy is right, they channel my work. Change is the only thing that you can count on in the theater. In order to do the work of art, you must be willing to change. Every play is a new experience. Every play is a new beginning. Every play must start clean and new. So I constantly go through a kind of depressing cycle of saying goodbye to all the people I just fell in love with with the last play and move into the new experience by changing. So I'd like to tell you very quickly my reconnection story. On March 12, 2020, only four of my 35 students showed up to my playwriting class at USC. That night, my university gave us a quick Zoom tutorial, and the next day I started teaching online. That first month was the hardest and maybe lowliest month of my life. I am a very, very social animal, and I'm also a person who works from a place of joy. So I do not like to think of art as scarcity, but actually a place of a deep, deep abundance. But I had never experienced depression the way I had to experience it then, it really took a hold of me. But because I'm an artist, because I'm a member of the Black Sheep family, because we artists are always looking for new ideas, that puts us in the avant-garde. I decided that although I would not be able to work on a play on stage, I could in fact do everything but the play, which was to deepen characters, to research history, to give myself over to the comfort of words. And because of who I am, a queer Chicano who works in the professional American theater, which is an industry that is led by an overwhelming white majority, which tells a disproportionately white and male narrative of America, it was my job to not only think of my work without parameter, but to think of myself as a political person. So everything I do in my life and work as a citizen artist, is not just for the pure joy of the art, but I believe the art is the way that I create change in the world. Art is the way that I make a shift and a change 
in the way the world can see itself. So all of my work is actually a series of questions. Every play begins an inquiry. I start every play with a larger question about the world, something that I'm obsessing with, something that I've been thinking for a long time about. As an example, in the last 10 years, I've been doing a series of uh, adaptation of Greek classic plays. One of them, Oedipus El Rey, based on Oedipus the King, it tells the story of the California prison system. So I read somewhere a fact that said that more than all, uh, half of all young men in a California prison of uh, 17 to 24 years old will return to prison at least once in their lifetime. The recidivism rate, the return to prison rate. Uh, and then I moved on to uh, Medea. And in my Medea, I'd read a, a, a fact that said that more than half of all women who cross the southern border undocumented into the United States are assaulted, usually sexually assaulted. What a price to pay to come to this country. So each of these questions feeds a larger question about the world. But more than that, it feeds a larger question about drama and about conflict and about the complication of the human condition. So when COVID hit, I was very depressed and I was uh, very lonely because I was in this darkened space and I was doing my best to avoid everybody in my very, very crowded neighborhood. So I'd get up at five in the morning and do a walk around the local park. And then I'd get up again around 11 at night and do another walk just to get my physical life together. But it, what was really happening was that I was feeling like the world was closing in on me and something needed to shift. This is what shifted. In the last year, I have visited over 57 classrooms around the country. I started to take trips to Canada. I went down to Latin America, and then I dipped over to Europe. Sometimes I wake up at three in the morning to work with the student in Shanghai. In other words, one world closed and the other one opened. Um, so I'm a big, big, huge fan of the Zoom thing. I begin to make the kind of connections that I never could before. I begin to be able to see the world in another way, which is to understand something about how we all interpret language and story. Each time I begin a relationship with a different uh, classroom or a different artist, I always go back to my source. And my source is a great playwright, a uh, gentleman by the name of Joe Chaikin, who wrote a really beautiful book called The Presence of the Actor. He wrote this book with a series of questions, and he asked these questions as a way of creating character. But I asked these questions of my fellow artists as a way of understanding how it is that we work. How do I create complexity and complication in my own writing? So here are three of the questions that I always start with when I'm creating a play. What is the one thing that people cannot see when they look at you? What is the one thing that people cannot see when they look at you? Sometimes, if I, I'm afraid to be vulnerable, I'll tell you about the little mole in the back of my neck. But if we want to really go there, I'll tell you about the year that I spent in a hospital taking care of my father before he died. Is there a part of you that has not lived yet? Is there a part of you that has not lived yet? What would make that part live? So all of these questions really are activation of character, activation of self, activation of artists. And slowly through this last two years of reconnecting in this little box with all of you and with hundreds of thousands of people around the world, I have become all the things that I used to be. Playwright, teacher, producer, caretaker, public parent, citizen artist. I am a better teacher, a better artist, and a better citizen. I started shopping for my elderly Korean neighbor. I traded food with the Salvadorian neighbors next door. And I changed almost every single part of my practice. The way I teach is not the way I used to teach. The way I write is not the way I used to write. The way I take care of my mother with dementia is very, very different. But most of all, the way I live is the life of an artist. I am more connected to the world than I ever thought I would be. 
I am a citizen artist and I tell stories from a corner called Pico Union that go out into the world. My story is your story. Our story is a story that we only understand through feeling, through emotion. There you go. Okay. Wow, Louise, thank you. Um, a, a lot to unpack there, but as you were as you were speaking to us, um, I was thinking about the way change truly is at the centerpiece of your work, that what you've told us about the pandemic was also about your responsiveness to change. And in, in a sense that um, I think we tend to say, how do we connect? There's a fixed answer to that. You know, like we need to know the plan, like walk our dog if we have one, as, as Mary reminded us. But, but in fact, I think what you're saying is, also connect to nothing as you connect to everyone else. But do I have that right? Yeah, I think you're right. I think we connect in the void, right? Um, what I'm interested in is people, of course, always, your complicated story, right? Your most complex self. But it always starts with, hello, who are we? How much of myself am I going to expose in this moment? Mary's story right now took me somewhere completely different, right? I am in now in the global of stories, right? Where I might have been in the local, I've now uh, entered into feeling and empathy and compassion. And that is all the theater teaches us. When we go to the theater, we learn how to be better people because we engage in empathy and compassion. What a simple idea and what an incredibly complicated idea too, right? Yeah, thank you, Luis. Um, thank you. Onward. Um, so onward meaning that before we shift to a conversation amongst our guests, here is that special project I've promised. The 10 questions team has been collaborating, i.e. connecting with Kevin Kane, director of UCLA's visual and performing arts education program. Um. Kevin, another longtime Angelino, has been working primarily in the realm of community arts with a particular curiosity and passion for creating arts programs in K through 12 settings throughout the LA area. I'm delighted to introduce Kevin Kane. Thank you, Vic. Um, and uh, hello, everybody. On behalf of um, VAPA, I want to say how excited we are to once again participate in the 10 questions series tonight. It's my pleasure to introduce a remarkable generation of theater artists, um, the ninth grade intro to theater students from the Los Angeles County High School for the Arts. And so um, I might add, it's a true honor for us to follow the great Luis Alfaro. Thank you, Luis. Um, tonight, these young students also respond to the question, how do we connect? And um, for those of us who might forget exactly how old a ninth grader is, um, these are 13 and 14 year olds. Um, and please bear in mind, um, like all students, these students spent the majority of their middle school years in their solitary home spaces, studying entirely on Zoom, which proves quite difficult when it, the subject you care most about is theater. So it's particularly wonderful to see them back in person, albeit masked, studying the art form they're most inspired by, exploring ideas of connection, both intellectually and kinesthetically. So to make this video, the students and I um, started with a group conversation about the nature of connection in the arts and in life. This led to reflective writing prompts answered at home via self-tapings. It culminated in a full group filming um, project on their campus, capturing the games and activities that are helping them feel the rush of social contact, touch, group collaboration, experiencing a kind of joy that's only possible when we are connected again in the same space at the same time together in community. What exactly we didn't have the last year and nine months. Um, before showing the video, I wanna thank our amazing VAPA 
videographer and editor Tigran Narcissian for his skill and um, patience in shooting this project. Tigran and I have edited it together in an attempt to represent all of the students' ideas about how and why the theater helps them connect and reconnect to themselves, to others, to their communities, and to society as a whole. Um, also, I'd like to um, thank, welcome, and congratulate the LOXA students, the ninth graders that are in the room um, right now. I see you. I looked at the participants list. It's a joy to have you here. I hope some of your families are sitting by your side and can um, also participate. Um, anyone from the theater department at LOXA, it's a great home to nurture the new um, generation of theater artists. So we're happy we're, you're with us tonight. Welcome to UCLA Arts, and let's show the clip. In the arts, we connect by being open-minded, curious, and imaginative. By being vulnerable and empathetic. We connect by working to accept everyone. By getting excited about all the things we have in common. And accepting all the things that makes us different. By creating art together. Theater helps us connect to the deepest part of ourselves. Get in touch with our emotions and experiences. Tell our stories and listen to other people's stories. Theater helps us connect to the characters we portray and then to all of humanity. Theater lets us connect to the communities we live in and the audiences that see us perform. Theater inspires us to connect to society and hopefully change it for the better. Theater is a living, breathing creature, constantly changing from performance to performance. You might catch a mistake or witness a brand new actor take on a role. You will never know exactly what to expect from a show. Performance as a concept is absolutely fascinating. Since the beginning of time, we have been standing up and saying, hey, watch me do this. And we all have been watching. For me, being on stage isn't about becoming a totally new person. There's always a part of me that's in the character. And we're the same, but we're also not the same. We work together as an ensemble with a common goal, hoping for the same outcome. Theater is a place where I've met healthy and long-lasting relationships, and I've made a family of many creative minds. In theater, we connect by relating and telling a story. We connect to others by relating to things. When we watch characters go through things that we have gone through, it, it almost creates a bond between the audience and the character, and that really helps us as an audience, relate to the character. We connect through theater by showing what we have in common with each other. And not only all the bad things we've been through, but also the good things. Theater helps us connect in many ways. For example, when you're performing on stage, the audience feels and hears your thoughts and it helps the audience connect with you and it's almost as if they can feel your energy and your character sometimes. Performing arts is the expression of emotions to relate and connect with others. How, you might ask? Here's a simple answer. Most of us share the same goals, the same joy and the same pain. We all relate to each other, either through the passion of empathy or the movements of spirit. Theater helps us connect in so many ways, whether it has to do with relatability or a connection to your role or even if it just pulls you in because you're so curious and interested. In theater, people could be witnessing the same thing but have completely different perspectives on it. That is an example of about how theater can be so much like life. One of the reasons why I chose to devote my time to theater is just because of how fun it is. Never have I connected with people in such a unique way than when I am on stage with them. Theater is sometimes a big step out of my comfort zone. So I have to find a way to connect and make myself feel more comfortable and confident. In my arts classes, I feel free and open to be who I am around all these people I know would never judge me for it. Acting is a way to express yourself mentally and physically. I connect to theater by learning my character, seeing how my character thinks, acts, and my character's body language. I think we connect in theater by using our five senses. We smell the space around us. We see each other and people's reactions. We hear what our partner is saying. We touch when our partner needs support. 
We speak to communicate ideas. We taste what the air tastes like. We sense what it means to be here in the moment, being present in the environment. Oh, wow. Dear students of Los Angeles County High School for the Arts, that was a love letter to theater. Theater. Thank you for your individual and collective responses to the question, how we connect. To all of us here, if you haven't already, please share your love in that chat with these extraordinary young people. I'm reading, that's why I'm laughing, I'm happy, I feel joyful. Um, so I, I think that um, those ninth graders over at LAXA and Kevin Kane probably just deserve a little bit of our love right here on this screen. Um, just let's take a moment to appreciate that work. <laughs> and, um, and not only do we have the ninth graders work, but the students at UCLA who are in this class, 10 questions, are also creating work and they're gonna be sharing that work on Friday um, with one another. So um, creating as a way of connection. Um, so just as we begin our discussion, I feel like we have touched down in so many places from the great macro sense of the way we have evolved to connect and the kinds of things that, that sort of create disruption and stand in our way to our individual vulnerability. And then also to the occupation of change making through theater, through telling the stories from, I love that, from Pico Union to the world, from, <laughs> you know, from Medea to, to the individual women who are crossing borders and dealing with the trauma of a, a world that is quite cruel. Um, so let's just take a moment. I'd just love to hear your thoughts on, on where you are with the, the largesse of this evening. What got said that, that is gonna stick with you? I know it's a lot to digest. It's a lot to digest. Well, one of the things that I'm I'm sitting with right now is just the way that um, we might tend to think of, you know, I shared my vulnerability and now I did that. Um, or I can talk about networks and so now you know about networks, but in the context of the only truth is change. Octavia Butler, um, let, us, let us also be aware that this moment is coming and going all at the same time. And any, any answers we have for this moment of how do we connect is also, um, you know, one, one answer, one moment in our, our lives. And, and maybe it's an opportunity for, for each of you to talk a little bit about what you see as how this is changing for you. And I'm also, oh, I got to see stuff in the chat that looks fabulous, but please, let's just jump in. Vic, do you want us to uh, respond to that? Sure, uh, this is just <laughs> an opportunity for us to um, bump around together, to connect, got it. as it were. Hmm. Well, maybe I'll jump in and just say, you know, when we think about human emotion, I don't think about it until tonight, the way Morton explained it, right? 
uh, I hadn't sort of quite thought the way we, uh, our synapses synapse, right? And I was thinking about that during your talk. I was thinking a lot about how we, we transfer energy on stage. We transfer idea and not just in language often. Often we just do it in body, right? We just embody something on stage. We give it depth. We give it the 3D of ourselves, right? And then we start to fill space. So I came of age at a time, uh, there was a theater company called The Living Theater, which is still around. And there was a kind of motto that we used a lot, which is move towards the space that needs you the most. So that's really sort of been my political sort of point of view too. Let me move towards the space that needs me the most, which is not always my own people. But my own people are very many people. Los Angeles is the space that needs me the most, right? So I was just thinking right now when Mary was talking, you know, not just in region, but also a need and want. And um, that's something we forget about a lot. What is the need and want of how systems are built, but how people connect, which is so, so important. So the theater is built on your desire to want to see yourself expressed, to want to feel yourself in, in someone else's story. What an amazing idea, right? And so when you talked about vulnerability, I was like thinking, wow, vulnerability is so hard, but isn't that what we do when we go to the movies? We sort of suspend everything, right? It happens when we go see dance. Uh, we sort of imagine ourselves in those bodies transcending, but also expressing something, right? And then in the systems, the way Morton was describing them, I started to think, wow, yes, the human, the human condition is also one of the pathways right? The, the, I don't want to say electrical energy, but what would you call that? Right? It, it actually is electrical energy. If you ask the, the people that are studying this, um, I would say, but to me, you know, that's less important. Um, I, I'm, I brought up those kind of um, uh, sort of more sciencey ways of looking at this, mostly to say that even if you ask science, uh, the most hardcore um, uh, sort of, um, people focused on uh, evidence and facts that you can find, even when you ask them, they will tell you that the most important thing we have is connection, that it is unavoidable for to be human without connecting. Being human, even at a physical level, requires connection. And I think that's, that's just, I mean, close to magical. I think that's, that's just amazing. Um, I, it's, there's something that happens uh, that they're still trying to figure out when we connect with our senses uh, that um, that's that's very fascinating, I think, that apparently has a lot of small details. But it, I think of that whenever I go to the theater uh, or go see a music show. Uh, I actually used to do a little bit of theater uh, when I was younger and seeing these uh, ninth graders reminded me of, I used to be a drama teacher for like four years or something long ago. And, and seeing these um, uh, ninth graders just brought me back to that and seeing the remembering how over the course of, of a few months, you can see students blossom and become different humans throughout that whole process. So uh, I, that is one of the most beautiful things that I've ever done in my life. But my point is that whenever you go to see something live, uh, whether it's music, whether it is dance, whether it is theater, um, it is always different than, than film. And I am a m massive film nerd, but it's always different because you have the uh, ability to connect with real humans. There's a different energy in the room. The fact that the, the, the actor can look down and catch an audience member's eyes, that can, that can change an entire, unless it's a really big theater, that can change a, an entire... Uh, performance because something else comes into uh, the head of the actor it can also change the entire experience for that person maybe change that person's life and that's just one very very short moment of connection right there uh, out of gazillions of those kind of connections that happen on the planet every single minute and so so to me it's just that, that, that element of human connection, it's so much of what we do with our lives that we need to make sure that we have all the, 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 the pathways to those connections cleared and, and, and made fair for everyone and made accessible for everyone. Mm. You know, from the, the students, the ninth graders in the video, there are a couple of things in there that I thought 
I will think about um, when I go to bed tonight and I'll think about again when I wake up. One of the young women said something to the effect of um, being vulnerable, sharing a story, being in theater. Um, sometimes you have to get out of your comfort zone. So what she does to refuel is do something that is in, gives her comfort. And I just thought that that was so beautiful. And it also, for me, I connected with one of the young men in the video who talked exactly about um, sort of this idea that I mentioned, which was showing your crack in your armor. And he said, every performance, whether it, you might see a mistake, but that's all part of the, the story and to me, the vulnerability and it sort of just highlights the beautiful in all of that. Um, so I, I thought that that was really poignant. I saw a question in the chat and uh, I'm sure you'll get to it. Someone says, how does one who finds emotional expression difficult work towards vulnerability? And, you know, I listened to uh, the students on that video and maybe that was part of it. You know, it's having your comfort food, doing something to refuel, maybe taking a risk as it feels comfortable to you, but also knowing that the differences, the mistakes are all parts of, you know, beauty. And uh, so I just really love that. That was so inspiring to me. Thank you, Mary. And, you know, I'm finding myself thinking that right here, this is theater right here, right now that we're doing together. And, and both, you know, the, the wisdom that you bring and also the vulnerability and also the, the, the chinks or the cracks in the armor are part of what makes it more meaningful that we're here talking to each other and trying to figure out connecting, you know, in these many registers of connection. Um, out, of, out of our comfort zone, right? You know, one of the ways that I, I do it in, in my classes was we talk about the difference between me and a want. When I want to write a play, I what happens is that when I want to write a play, I want to write something that makes me look good. I want to be funny. I want to be sexy, right? I want to be many things. I want to be light. When I need to write a play, I need to tell you a story. And in that story, I'm a very, very complicated, good and challenged person, and I'm, and I'm complex in my character. So the need story is always the harder story to tell, but it is the story that takes me out of my comfort zone and makes me want to exchange. But what I think Mary was, was saying right now, this energy of vulnerability back and forth. Right. I need to tell you this because I want to understand myself or understand you or create change. Right. My want is ego. <laughs> My want is like, I just want to look good. Right. I just want to be loved. Right. But that's different than. Um, and I don't know. I, I just throw that out because I think a lot about how need makes us do something and want makes us do something else. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to throw in one other thought. I, I know that there are some questions that are, you know, blooming everywhere, but um, um, because this is also, we're, this is UCLA, and also, you know, we have our ninth grade students, we also have our UCLA students here. Um, I keep thinking that, you know, what is learning? How can you really, really, like, be passionate about class? <laughs> And, and I think that it's everything you're talking about. It's, it's about feeling like it's not one dimension of yourself that's in that room picking up this information, but that you have, like the class allows you to have so much at stake that it matters that you're there, that vulnerability is present. And, you know, and quite, you know, likely whoever is the host of that class um, their vulnerability, ours is, you know, it's like how you answer the door when guests come over. It's like, I am so glad to see you or, oh, oh uh, put your coat over there or whatever. So like we are creating theater in the classroom. We are um, ask, uh, 
in, in that most ideal world, um, we are connecting in that room. And it doesn't always happen, but I'm so excited about allowing it to happen. Yeah, every, okay. ses every session is a performance, right? Every session is a performance. When you get up and you lecture or you even give out an assignment, you know, I am bringing joy into the room. My, I want to model for you the excitement I have about theater, right? The joy that I want to bring into the room. I want you to be emotional. So I am going to be really emotional. I'm going to bring this in. And there's something about how I enter a room I cross over the line, and when I open that door into a classroom, I'm usually in one of the science buildings, um, but that's okay. When I walk into that, that science lab to teach playwriting, I am really walking into a laboratory for expression. I'm really walking into a room filled with only possibility. That's it. I'm connecting a thread over a long, long ancient time and I am now connecting you to the ancient text and you are creating the next line of the modern that will lead us into the future. That's it. It's a, it's a, it's a science room, right? It's truly incremental. It's truly progressive in that way, right? So I love when I go into these labs because I think, whoa, great, this is the theater. The theater is here right now. Um. Can I say something about some of the questions that uh, have come in the Q&A about anxiety? Yes, I'm um, so glad for you to do that. There's, um, uh, Vic, you said earlier that, you know, sometimes it's important not to be solutionist uh, and, and say that there is just one solution to any question, right? Um, sometimes there's not an answer. Sometimes there's, uh, there's just asking more questions. Um, I want to say, just preface what I'm about to say with saying that I think any question of anxiety is is not going to have an easy answer. Um, but uh, there was one thing that one of the ninth graders said that I uh, that really stuck with me, which was something along the lines of, uh, "For thousands of years, we have stood up and and said, hey, look at me.'" that performance is so much a part of our culture. Um, that's true in the West. It's a, uh, it's a very, I would say, Western way of looking at things. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm deliberately using the word Western because I don't want to taint it any, in, in any of the directions it might be tainted. But uh, if you look at Eastern cultures, for example, it's very much not like that. Um, there's a reason why traditional Japanese theater is all masked. Uh, there's a reason why um, shadow theater is a, is, is a thing. Um, uh, I grew up in Denmark, and in Denmark we have, even though it's a very Western country, a very what we call repressive normality. Um, you do not shine a light on yourself. It's just seen as arrogant, even if you if you say anything that might be self congratulatory. Um, it's and and though we of course have great theater in in Scandinavia and all that, um, that I, I know that sensibility, and I see it in a lot of my students from uh, from East Asia, um, uh, but on steroids. Uh, I see them coming in and having real uh, speech hesitancy, uh, real fear of speaking up in class at a at a level that's that's maybe too loud, um, and and I think uh, I think it's important to acknowledge that. I think it's important when we when we are uh, discussing how we can express ourselves as human beings and thereby create connections, that there are people with serious inhibitions in that regard, not just because of culture, but also because of neurodiversity. And um, I don't have an answer to that. Um, I uh, have struggled with it myself at one point, but theater actually helped me, believe it or not, uh, 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 to get over that. Um, the, that's, that's like a trial by fire. Sometimes that's not for everyone. Um, but it is something that I think we need to be more conscious of, that, uh, that um, 
it is not easy for everyone to speak up, um, uh, even though we may assume so. Mm, thanks so much for, for bringing that up, Martin. Um, and I just, just to, to stay on that theme a moment longer, um, you know, uh, Mary, you talked about the trauma of the pandemic, of really being isolated. And I wonder if we could just spend another moment just uh, with the question, how do you overcome social anxiety after being used to not connecting in person due to the pandemic? And again, I, I, I know Morton said there isn't one answer, but-, but um, let's, let's, get, let's get a lot of answers. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> let's do that. I'll tell you for myself, um, you know, this is something that uh, I experience as well. Um, I loved hearing when Louise talked about wanting that connection and, and craving social interaction. And I loved it because I am the opposite. And, um, you know, and it's really, uh, I always find it to be interesting where I'm a professional communicator. Um, and yet I am very comfortable being by myself and binge watching TV all day or whatever it is that I do. And so for me, when I was thinking of this, connect, uh, this question, how do we connect? It was really about how do we reconnect and feeling that social anxiety um, I don't think there is one answer, as Morton said, but the way that I've been um, trying it out and trying different jackets on is um, slowly, slowly and surely and giving myself a little bit of a break, you know, and as anxious or uncomfortable as I might feel and socially awkward, you know, that when you're at a dinner and you're so focused on making sure the conversation is flowing and making everyone feel included. And it used to be second nature to me. And I went to this dinner and I just felt so socially <laughs> awkward and started staring at my thumbs. And I thought, you know, it's okay. Just cut myself a little bit of a break um, because we all sort of deserve it, you know? And I felt like You're here. that is a collective feeling and a sense of maybe collective compassion we're all having for one another. So I don't know how to solve for it outside of the only thing that I was able to sort of control myself, which was not my awkwardness, but um, just being, you know, maybe a little kinder. It's all right um, to feel that anxiety. Thank you for that reminder, Mary. And, you know, I, I'm just thinking that as you so beautifully did here tonight, sometimes just bringing it to that register, like, you know what, it's really hard be here and connecting and maybe that becomes the way we connect you know i want to just there's one other question i see our, our time is waning but um on, i think that's very important for us to spend a moment with which is um trying to connect with people that you can't really communicate well with and this person suggests whether it's a language barrier or a different culture, but I just want to bring up the really big, maybe it feels to me like an elephant in the room, um, a lovely elephant in the room, which is, you know, when it's really, really hard to connect and the work is to connect, how do we do it? And, or, you know, how each of you in your own careers, life, work, this must come up frequently when it's really, really hard to connect. And it's not any longer about the personal anxiety, but it's the social that sits there and is a challenge. So can we just dip our toes in, into that? Sure, it's, it's really hard. I will say that, you know, I'm, I'm gonna preface this by saying something that happened in my class last week. So my students started bringing in less pages to their plays and I was really concerned. So I stopped everything and I said, in one word, just tell me what you're feeling right now. And the words that popped up were anxiety, exhaustion, depression, worry, right? All the stuff that we thought we had gotten over in the pandemic, we're still in, right? We now are back on ground and actually none of those feelings have actually gone away. And so we started working very, very differently. And this is very hard to do, but it's the thing that I think I do a lot. Uh, 
myself because I find it difficult to meet people, but I'm on, my job is to be out in the world doing this, right? So one of the things I do is I always say to myself, the only thing you have going for yourself right now, Luis Alfaro, is being honest and being authentic. So if I was radically honest and authentic right now, I would say that I have spent a year and a half in grief and loss, right? I caretake a mother with dementia. And rather than denying that part of myself, let me bring that into the room with me. That authenticity, that honesty of who I am, no one will ever turn away from who the authentic you is, right? So I feel that that's one of the ways I jump 10 steps in my playwriting. It is the way that I get to work in a lot of boardrooms and all that stuff, right? Because I can only bring me into the room. And the me that I bring, I really love me. I really like me. <laughs> I mean, you know, I know there's a problems with me, but you know, I really like what I bring into the room. So bringing that into the room is the connective tissue, right? I don't need to bring somebody else into, I don't need to bring Tennessee Williams into the room because he, he already came into the room, right? But we haven't met Luis Alfaro yet. So how do we all do that as citizens, as people in the world? How do we bring our most authentic, and honest selves, and knowing that that is the deepest, most vulnerable thing we can do. And yet it is the invitation to say hello. It is the invitation to say hello. And that is what I do in the classroom. I'm happy to be the first fool in my classroom. I'm happy to be the first fool because I promise you, you're all gonna join my crazy circus in 30 sessions, right? Authentic and honest, that's all I can give you. And it's full of possibility. That's important, I think. Hmm. I love that. Yeah, I think that's that's very true. I would I would um, I would very much uh, hear here, uh, Louise. I think that's really good. Um, I want to. I just want to add something really quick. Um, one of the things that I've noticed among my students uh, when it comes to anxiety uh, is that and uh, this is something i've observed over a, a long time and also i'm working on in my own uh with my own sort of uh, uh, mental situation um is that almost any fear you have any resentment too can be traced back to a fear of the unknown i mean it's almost evolutionary it's almost to the point where it's down to the fear that was sort of placed in our uh, hereditary systems because we can't see at night. So we have to be afraid of the dark. And uh, because if we're not afraid of the dark, we won't be alert for the lion that's coming to eat us. You know, it's almost at that level. But the, but the fear of the unknown is, is almost something that you can always boil things down to. And so one of the, uh, the pieces of advice that I've given my students is to ask, how do you know? Um, how, how do you know what's going to happen? And uh, as it turns out, um, a lot of the times when you ask that question, you find out you don't know. Uh, you don't know that, that things are going to go wrong. You don't know that, that you're uh, going to uh, fail this class. You don't know that this person isn't going to like you. You don't know that, that, that you're going to feel awkward when you get up on that stage. You don't know that, you, that you're going to feel awkward when you walk into a room of, of uh, a, a bunch of people that you don't know. You don't know. There's no way for you to know because we can't really know the future. We just can't. And so um, I, I've tried to sort of apply a more Taoist way of looking at it saying, okay, I, I walk into this completely free of expectations of what I think could happen because I have no clue. Uh, I'm just going to experience this and then see what happens. Um, that's hard to do because we're, we're uh, as Westerners, we're brought up to, to think uh, in consequences all the time. Mm. But I think, um, I think it can sometimes be helpful to just say, I don't know. I just don't know. I am not... I'm not smart enough to know the future, so I'm not going to be afraid of it. Yeah, I think that's so, that's so, I love that, Morton. And what you said about, um, you know, how do you know you won't be liked? And I think this gets to maybe a little bit of the question or the how I interpret the question. 
is what happens if there is no connection and there just isn't one. And I love what Louise said in terms of just bringing your, you know, your full complex self and being authentic and honest and human. And sometimes it's okay, you know, if you don't connect with someone else, as long as you can come and be your true self and hear and listen, you don't always have to connect. And I might take that one step further. You don't always have to be light. And that's really hard. I think that's especially hard today. You know, Morton talked about social media a little bit. So, um, you know, I use social media. And literally what you're doing is collecting the likes, right? It, it's sort of trained in our language and, and what we are doing, pressing or accounting for. So I think now more than ever, it's really difficult. And for me, I just try and remind myself as hard as it is, you know, the elephant in the room, why don't you like me? Why can't you, I connect with you. Why can't you connect with me? I'm trying so hard. Sometimes it might be okay. It might be okay because maybe it'll happen later. You just don't know, right? And maybe it's a good thing that you can't connect to this person. Maybe that person turns out to be a psychopath, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's uh, sometimes you got to trust the universe in mm -hmm. that regard. I really, I really firmly believe that. Um, I'm going to jump in here. Um, I'm thinking to myself, boy, do I have issues with not being liked. I'm really <laughs> trying to learn how to be okay with that. Um, um, but that aside, <laughs> um, I would like to ask you each, um, I'm going to take this a step further. How do we connect with people who see the world very differently from us? And I suspect that in each of your different worlds that you mostly operate in, you have to deal with people who, or not deal with, you are with people who see very differently from you. And maybe there's something you want to do. How do you, how do you make that connection with people who see differently? Well, I, I never ever enter a room um, a fully, fully not ready to negotiate, I guess I should say. So what I work in the American Regional Theater, right, which, which is disproportionately white and male right now, right? All the leaders that I work for are very different from me. And what I am offering the American theater are the voices of BIPOC women, queer stories, that's what I'm advocating for, right? So I go into boardrooms, I go to funders, I go to all those people, but I come as your friend. So I'm a diplomat, right? I am here to show you the joy of difference. And I, uh, if I'm going to show you the joy of difference, I have to accept that your difference is my joy too. So um, when someone in an audience gets mad, let's say uh, I have, in some of my plays, I use English and Spanish and then I use Spanglish. And then sometimes I use the ancient language, not what, right? And there will be someone in the audience who say, why did you use that language? I didn't understand it, blah, 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 blah. right? And I'll say, listen, let me tell you my story about how I discovered Shakespeare. Because it always takes me about 10, 15 minutes before a Shakespeare play to kind of know <laughs> what would like to listen to the rhythm. Then you're like, okay, now I get how they're doing this you and I are speaking the same language. We're only talking to each other through feelings. We're only talking to each other through the most passionate things that we want to see forward. So how do we negotiate that? And that's what I do at the Music Center all day. I work with people who are completely different than me, lawyers, right? I work with a lot of, that, of those people and they have a very, very different point of view than mine. But my job is to find us in the middle because in the middle, it's where our possibility is, right? In the middle is where we come to a kind of agreement that your story and my story is the same story. Our deep, deep empathy and compassion. It is hard to get there sometimes. It is really hard to get there sometimes. But you know what changed for me? Like living in Koreatown and only shopping in Korean markets where nobody speaks English? Empathy and compassion. Now I'm everybody's favorite, like chubby guy who comes in and gets the stuff, right? I'm everybody's friend. That took a long time to do. Let's meet in the middle because when, what this country is giving us right now is this, right? 
And there's, there's, we have to, we have to do a little bit of this. Mm. Mary, I, I want to ask you the same question. Um, how, how do you connect with people who see the world very differently from us? And I, 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 I want to just throw in, you know, UCLA and our community, like, how, do, how do you think about that? Yeah. You know, it's difficult. And I think the past several years is, has drawn a brighter line in a lot of respects. Um, for UCLA, I try and remember every day, I really do, that UCLA is a really big tent. It really is. And that's what makes this the place that I honestly, I love this place. I love all, I love every aspect of it, the things I don't agree with, the things I don't get. Um, but I think that this is a place where we, UCLA values that diverse thought. And just, I try and remember it's a really big tent. As a communicator, as a communicator, um, it's tough too. But what I try and do when getting the criticism, your, your institution or your brand or your whatever it is as a communicator that you're representing, when getting that criticism is just trying to bear it and strip it all down and boil it down to maybe what is the shared humanity there? You know, what's that shared feeling or that shared emotion that we may all agree upon? And we might be so at odds on how you get there and what is right and what is wrong, but somewhere I try and look for that shared humanity um, and maybe work towards that emotion. So that's what I try and do, but it is hard. Mm. Oh, I'm glad you're the one who's doing it. <laughs> glad you're there. And Martin, I want to ask the same question of you, but I, you know, in my mind, you are a technologist. I don't know if that's a word a philosopher, a scientist, an ethicist. And you, you know, basically presented to us these ideas about networks of connection and kind of moved us right up against the ways in which these large corporations that are connecting us are not connecting us. So I don't know if that's a way that you would like to respond to this question, but how <laughs> do you connect with um, people or corporations or, you know, that see very differently? Um, so there's, for me, a very long answer to that question and a, and a shorter one. So I'm going to try to stick to the shorter one. <laughs> um, the, I, I would say uh, in terms of, I, I do believe that, that as long as there's money in tearing people apart, the people that that somebody will try to do that to make money and and i think that's that's what we're seeing right now um uh it's not necessarily you know it's happened in other industries uh before it happened in tech um uh it's uh, you know the media uh industry is full of this uh, going back to uh i i found a fun example actually um August 7, 1721, so, you know, a little over uh, 300 years ago, um, the uh, Benjamin Franklin's brother, James Franklin, uh, 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 published the first edition of his newspaper, uh, the New England Courant. Um, and on the front page of that newspaper, was an anti-vaxxer statement uh, where he said, where he was objecting to the state of Massachusetts forcing people to get uh, inoculated against smallpox. Uh, and I, you know, it, it blew my mind that, that it's almost 300 years to the day uh, that we are experiencing the same thing. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's rather, so, 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 you know, he was thrown in jail for that. Um, that's not a solution. Uh, that's not a way to, to, to answer the question. I think the, the answer to the question actually goes back to something Luis said earlier. Uh, Luis, you asked, uh, what is it that you can't see uh, when you look at me, right? I, 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 th I was absolutely certain that your, that your response, rather than the mole, uh, was going to be pain. Um, 
I believe every single person carries pain and uncertainty. Every single person. The people who don't are psychopaths, maybe more like sociopaths. I'm joking, of course, but um, uh, most people carry um, pain and uncertainty. And I think we all need to be aware of that. We need to know that when we see somebody who is doing something we don't agree with, they're doing it because they are in pain and they feel uncertain, just like we do. And, and that's a compassion thought. Uh, on top of that, for a more, uh, on the sort of more organizational level, you always hear influencers uh, on social media say that, you know, they just want to spread positivity. Um, I think that's BS. Uh, I think that you cannot have positivity without negativity. That's like just another Taoist uh, truthism. Um, but what you can have is constructivism. You can you can think about being constructive in your in your um, uh, as as you move into life rather than destructive. You can you can move into saying I want to I want to build with people. I want to build up with people no matter what. Uh, even if we disagree, I want to see what we can build and construct together rather than think I need to tear down what they're saying so that I can build my thing. So I think rather than talking about positivism, I think we need to talk about constructivism and having a constructive attitude towards the world. Thank you so much, Morton. Um, time has truly waned. It finished waning and now it's in past tense. Um, I just want to say a few words before we close tonight. Um, um, firstly, just this notion of what is it that you don't see when you look at me? Um, I think we've all learned a little bit about one another in ways that we never would have known. Um, and, um, and I think that that's a question we could take out with us tonight as we meet each and every next person that we, including the people we think we know well, right? Um, whether it's about the pain we carry, the stories we carry, the shame because we don't even tell those stories um, or you know, countless other things. Um, let's think about that as we approach the question of connecting. I think it will change our ideas about connecting when we think about what we cannot see. And thank you for that thought, Louise. Um, I'm going to now um, um, just remind students that um, tomorrow before 5 p.m., please post to the forum. We're really looking forward to the ways in which you're responding to the public conversation, your own musings and connections, and, and we hope you'll, you'll do that by, by sharing your vulnerability, um, because that invites, as we've thought about tonight, that invites others to do the same. Um, as we conclude, if you'd like to visit us with, visit with us in a sort of backstage conversation, please raise your virtual hand, that's not this one, the virtual one, and we'll beam you up to join our guests and production team for a couple minutes. You can come say hello if you'd like. So this concludes this evening's program, and we hope you will join us again next week for How Do We Remember? Same time, new link. And if you want to learn more about the series or RSVP, visit arts.ucla.edu, 10 questions, and go ahead and Connect. And thank you so much to our guests.